Welcome to worship with the community of the Broad Street Presbyterian Church. My name is Ann Palmerton, and I'm a pastor here. We invite you to learn more about the church through our Facebook page or our website. We're glad you're worshiping with us on this third Sunday in the season of Advent. My sermon today is from John's Gospel, Chapter 1, the story of John the Baptist. I'm calling the sermon, Get This Straight. The Ajibi family lights our third Advent candle. Brittany Porch offers a children's time. Our music includes an anthem by the Broad Street Choir recorded before the pandemic called Every Valley by John Ness Beck. Bill Boggs sings a Taze chorus Colin Richardson offers our prelude and postlude, and Valerie Hildreth and Lynn Meyer offer Still, Still, Still for flute and piano. We are on an Advent journey together. We are companions on the road to Bethlehem. Together we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us worship God. Oh, come thou, day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thy advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to Our prayer this morning is less a prayer of confession than a prayer of waiting. Written by Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann. We give you thanks for the babe born in violence. We give you thanks for the miracle of Bethlehem, born into the Jerusalem heritage. We do not understand why the innocents must be slaughtered. We know that your kingdom comes in violence and travail. Our time would be a good time for your kingdom to come because we've had enough of violence and travail. So we wait with eager longing and with enormous fear because your promises do not coincide with our favorite injustices. We pray for the coming of your kingdom on earth as it is around your heavenly throne. We are people grown weary of waiting. We dwell in the midst of cynical people, and we have settled for what we can control. We do know that you hold initiative for our lives, that your love planned our salvation before we saw the light of day. So we wait for your coming in your vulnerable baby in whom all things are made new.
as we wait for the one in whom all things are made new. I invite you to listen first to words of hope. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, everything, including us, is made new. Alleluia and amen. I now invite you to listen to words of peace. The peace of Christ be with you this day and every day. Amen. Blue is the color of getting ready. Blue is the color of the sky just before dawn. Advent is the season of getting ready. And blue is the color of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she is about to have a baby. The church learned a long time ago that people needed time to get ready to enter or even get close to the mystery of Christmas. The church set apart four weeks, the four weeks of Advent, to get ready for the great mystery of Christmas. The first Sunday of Advent, we remembered the prophets who pointed the way to Bethlehem. The second Sunday of Advent, we remembered the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and her riding on a donkey to Bethlehem. This third Sunday of Advent, we remember the shepherds who were standing in the fields around Bethlehem keeping their sheep. They were trying to stay awake <sighs> so that wolves would not come to get their sheep. Suddenly, there was so much light in the sky that it hurt their eyes. They were afraid. Their hearts were beating so loudly. When they could hear something beside their own hearts, they heard what they thought was singing in the sky. They were so scared, it scared them until they heard the words of the song. It was angels singing. Do not be afraid. Angels often say that because it's scary to have a messenger from God to come to you. The angels singing sounded something like this. Don't be afraid. We bring you great tidings of joy, peace on earth, and goodwill to everyone. A child is born. Go, hurry, run to Bethlehem to see the child who will change everything. We are all on our way to Bethlehem. Let us pray. Gracious God, in a broken and fearful world, you give us courage. Speak to us in our Advent waiting. Open our hearts and minds so we may receive your good news for our lives and for this time. Amen. 
A reading from John's Gospel, chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when religious leaders sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 2018, emergency room doctors spoke out about gun violence in America. Based on what they were witnessing in the ER, they called it a crisis. The National Rifle Association soon responded. The NRA scolded them in a tweet and told them to stay in their lane. That comment implied that what the doctors were saying about guns and gun safety was irrelevant because it wasn't their area of expertise. It was out of their lane. Physicians then responded by sharing stories of traumatic gun-related injuries and deaths witnessed under their care. Those stories were collected under the hashtag This is our lane. The NRA used the phrase, stay in your lane, to strip doctors of their power. It was their way of saying, our voice is the one that matters, so stay out of our way. Instead, the doctors claimed their lane. Their experiences in the trauma bays, wearing blood-soaked scrubs, telling parents their children had died, those experiences fueled their prophetic words about gun violence and gun safety. They got in the way because they knew which way things needed to go. In our scripture reading, the authorities interrogate John about his lane and the way he seems to be going with his message. It's as if he has been taken downtown for questioning. Who are you? They think he might be the Messiah. The Bible says he confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. In that moment, John could have switched lanes. He could have chosen a different way. He could have said, truth be told, I am pretty special. But he chooses to stay in his lane. That is his strength. That is his superpower. Every year in Advent, the lectionary drags us to the Jordan River so we can hear John's voice. Before we get to the manger, before we hear the Christmas angels, we have to go into the wilderness and hear John speak. He tells the authorities and all of us, get this straight. 
Someone is coming who has the power to change everything. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other three Gospels, we know this straight shooter as John the Baptist. In those accounts, John is like a street corner preacher calling people to repent. He's eccentric and dresses oddly. He eats locusts and wild honey. He renounces things of this world. During other years of Advent, when we have read from those other accounts, John has seemed so out of place, so odd, so very strange. But this year, with the humanitarian crisis we're facing in our own country and globally, with COVID-19 numbers soaring, with so many suffering economic hardship, And with our own collective longing for the vaccine, well, maybe John doesn't seem so strange after all. Maybe the River Jordan isn't that far away. People are drawn to John's message about a restart, a new start. He baptizes them and preaches that the kingdom of God is at hand wherever they're from, Whatever they've done, whoever they are, John helps them get ready for God. He stays in his lane. He stays on message. He gives it to them straight. There's hope. There's a chance. There's a reset button for everyone's life. Author and activist Glennon Doyle is candid about her commitment to sobriety and her reset buttons. In her book, Untamed, she talks about choosing not to abandon herself. She describes her choices to essentially stay in her lane, to not reach for a quick fix in the midst of pain and stress. Here are some things she does to make staying with herself a little more possible. She calls these practices her reset buttons. Drink a glass of water. Take a walk. Take a bath. Practice yoga. Meditate. Go to the beach and watch the waves. Play with my dog. Hug my wife and kids. Hide the phone. Simple things serve as resets. Drink a glass of water. They help her avoid reaching for that quick fix when she's feeling anxious. They help her inhabit her lane, sober. They set her straight. In our scripture reading, John's job is to testify to the light, to point to Jesus. He does that from his lane, fully, energetically, totally. He doesn't try to be the savior of the world. He accepts the role he's been given. Theodore Roosevelt once said, do what you can with what you have, where you are. Those words have spoken to me through the years in life and in ministry. They are another way of saying Stay in your lane, inhabit it fully, take on what is in front of you, embrace the life you have been given, do what you can with what you have, where you are. These days, maybe that means juggling working and being home with young children. Maybe that means getting up several times a night to feed a baby. Maybe that means helping out a family member in need. Maybe that means taking a risk in a relationship. Maybe doing what you can with what you have, where you are, means asking for help or reassessing what gives you purpose and meaning or forgiving someone you never thought you could forgive. 
Maybe it means grieving a loss so you can live again. It is not our job to be the savior of the world. In our lane, it is our job to do our part, to believe in second chances and to take a chance that they are real, even when it's hard to believe. John finds his lane as the first witness to Jesus. He points to the light of the world. This year, our online Advent and Christmas devotional is based on a poem by Howard Thurman. Thurman was born in 1899, the grandson of a former slave. He became a Baptist pastor, theologian, and civil rights activist. Thurman's poem is called, I Will Light Candles This Christmas. He invites us to light candles, either literally or metaphorically, to choose actions done in love. I invite you to read his poem with me. I will light candles this Christmas, candles of joy despite all the sadness, candles of hope where despair keeps watch, candles of courage for fears ever present, candles of peace for tempest-tossed days, candles of grace to ease heavy burdens, candles of love to inspire all my living, candles that will burn all year long. One way we can light these candles is to stay in our lane, to plant our feet where we are and to choose the good. We light these candles when we use our God-given voices on behalf of others. That's what the emergency room doctors did from their respective lanes. In our scripture lesson, John quotes the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice of one crying out, in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John trusts that God is in this straightening out. Rough places will be smoothed out. Bumpy places will be leveled out. High anxiety will be brought low and made manageable. God is working on a reset. The one to whom John points will set us all straight. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This one, Jesus, calls us beloved and insists that no matter what, God will always find us. That no matter what, God keeps loving us. It doesn't matter what scars or secrets we carry. There was someone who knows us as we have always longed to be known. Someone who has come to live in our lane. Who navigates the highs and lows with us, who shares the thrills of the curves and the straightaways with us. John came to point to the Messiah, but the best news is that the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. As John might say, get this straight. You are not alone. You are loved. You matter. So drink a glass of water. Light a candle. Hope is real. A reset is possible. Amen.
We turn to God now, God, our source of hope and life. Let us pray. Creator of the universe, source of all that has ever been and ever will be, we come before you today with our needs and concerns and hopes and dreams, and we place all of that before you. We pray for those whose names were just shared, the sick and the grieving. We pray for the families of Lydia Guide and Casey Goodson. We pray for all those struggling to breathe. We pray for all those struggling for any reason, struggling with fear, with loneliness. We pray for kids and parents and educators, for those facing economic uncertainty. We pray for the helpers and healers, for everyone trying to find their place in this current reality. We pray for the earth, this place of beauty and possibility. And we cherish everything that makes our current path a little easier. Resilience, creativity, courage, connections, beauty. We place before you our hopes, our dreams for a better future for all of God's people, for all of God's creation. Make us participants in that future. All of us doing our part, all of us together, all of us together. Amen. Let us continue together in prayer by using the words that Jesus gave us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the season of giving. And I invite you to give to the church as together we do our small part to make this world a little more just and a little more whole. I thank you for your generosity.
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Looking ahead, I invite you to enter deeply into this Advent season. Uh, tonight, there'll be a 7 p.m. candle lighting Zoom with me and Brittany. Uh, we will play a game or two, sing some Christmas songs, and together light our third Advent candle, all from the uh, comfort of our own homes. Um, and looking ahead to next Sunday, we will have a special edition Zoom coffee hour uh, that we're calling Cookies and Wassail. And that will be Sunday, December 20th at 10 a.m. And we're working on some special plans for Christmas Eve, um, an online worship experience, uh, as well as a daytime drive-through church experience. More details to come. Uh, keep looking to those Saturday emails for all the information you need. Now I invite you to receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace this day and every day. Amen.